So good evening, everyone. I'm Anthony Lesky, K-A-Z-T, and... And I'm Marty Wall, N6 Victor, India. This is our annual field day update, field day 2023. Go ahead, Marty. All right. Um, you know, it's always a good idea to browse the rules. And uh, in this case, there are there are two, uh, two kinds of rule changes, those that almost got made and those that did get made. <laughs> The one that almost got made uh, started earlier in the year when uh, uh, some folks on the ARL board decided that uh, maybe the two points for CW was outdated and it should be one point like every like all the phone contacts. And uh, unfortunately, they didn't they didn't contact the uh, the uh, contest advisory committee about that because, of course, field day is not a contest. Har har. Uh, and, and all hell broke loose. So I think they uh, they met a month later and kind of decided to reconsider that. So as of now, at least, uh, the point values for contacts remain the same, two for CW, two for digital, and uh, one for phone. There was an interesting discussion at the, um, at the uh, ARL um, contest forum at International DX Con uh, Convention in Visalia just uh, last weekend. And uh, one of the uh, folks opined that uh, for digital, if it's FT8, it should count one point at most because it's not really a an emergency communication mode. You can't just put a bunch of text in there and and uh, use it for real time exchanges. And uh, that of course didn't change either. But the uh, the opinions were interesting. The rule change that did make it is that the maximum power allowed now for all stations, regardless of class, is 500 watts. Uh, for most of you who are going to be operating out in the field, that should make no difference at all because uh, very, very seldom does anybody run kilowatts on field day. There are so many reasons not to, uh, but now it's, it's 500 watts, but the uh, classes remain. So if you're going to be, uh, if you want the two times power multiplier, uh, you keep it down to 100 watts. So with that, back to Anthony. Well, very good. And uh, so let's just... Uh... I mentioned already that you can get to the slideshow at tiny.cc FD2023. And there's about 150 slides in this slideshow. We're not going to go through all those. They're there for you to look at later on. So this is going to require some homework on your part. The slideshow is accumulation of three years of presentations. It's a collection of resources for you to read through after our talk. We will be skipping through some slides and entire sections during our talk. To make it more convenient for you, the next slide has links on it. These are all links so you can jump to any point in the slideshow. So when you're viewing this later on, you say, oh, what was that thing about field day locator? You can simply click on this and it will take you to that particular slide. So these are hyperlinks within the slideshow. So the purpose of the slideshow is to provide clubs and individuals with ideas to encourage active participation in field day 2023 to get the maximum number of hams involved in field day in whatever class, style, mode they choose, to make field day a learning experience for all, new, all hams with a focus on new and potential hams, and really to talk about the fact that there are a number of options out there, whether you're working with a group, working individually, or what we're going to refer to as hybrid, where you're working individually, but your scores are going to be aggregated as uh, in the club listings but not as an individual entry, but in the club aggregate. For all the official rules and all the official things in this, the awrl.org slash field dash day is the place to get everything you need. And again, whenever you see this symbol in the slideshow or this font, that means you can click on it and it will take you out to that resource. So this gets you all the information you could possibly want. And the first thing I would suggest you do is go into the section that says rules, entry forms, and information packets and download the field day packet, the first one here. So Marty already mentioned a couple of the changes. The other big changes involve the go to station. Uh, there's some increased bonuses available and some little bit different way the rules are written. So if you're going to do a GOTA, which I strongly suggest you do if you can qualify for that, uh, we'll go through those individual rules a little later. The three power levels also depend on your class. So you can't run 500 watts if you're a class B station or a D or an E 
but you can if you're an A. And we'll go through those a little bit later. The other big change is multi-channel streaming and automated operations are prohibited. This is to prevent the MSHV on uh, FT8 where you can run three stations and uh, automate things. Um, so that's uh, those are prohibited. And then the fourth change is a rather subtle change, but there are some new RAC sections. So Radio Amateur Canada has a few new sections. They've shrunk a few down. They've changed the names on a couple. Not really major things, but no more greater Toronto area it is now the illustrious Golden Horseshoe. So uh, GH instead of GTA. So Marty, I'm going to go through the slides, but I'll let you go ahead and uh, you let me know when you want to take over talking here. Uh, traditionally, a group activity based activity for amateur radio clubs and their members, AWRL Field Day is often New Ham's first exposure to HF operations, setting up of antennas and stations, HF simplex versus the typical VHF repeater operation that many New Ham's are used to, and it's operating in a contest-like style. And again, we're going to say contest-like or similar to a contest, but it's not really a contest, even though a lot of the operations are very similar to what happens in a contest. Yeah, let, let me just clarify. It's it's not an adjudicated contest. That is, they don't uh, they don't uh, compare logs and cross check and things like that. But it is, as Anthony says, contest type scoring. And uh, you know, part of the part of the lure of this for a lot of folks is to see if they can improve the overall performance of their setup from one year to the next. And, uh, and by by improving the setup and by improving the operators' uh, preparedness and so on, uh, the the most convenient way to measure yourself from one period to the next is by looking at the score. So you know that that that's where the scoring really comes in. Yeah, really, the biggest competition is actually against yourself. You should be really looking at what your score was over the last couple of years compared to your score this year. So that's the really big score you want to be looking at as opposed to necessarily what where you finish in the order of points. Um, some people also say it's an emergency, it's an MCOM operation. Well, it's not really that either. It's, I like the words of Stan K4SBZ. It's not a test of MCOM. It's a demonstration of MCOM. In other words, it's a PR event to demonstrate to the public what we can do, not only for MCOM, but also other activities of amateur radio. Uh, if you look at the AWRL 2022 packet, and this is from the 22 pack packet, I didn't change this. It says, field day is a picnic, camp out, practice for emergencies, an informal contest, and most of all, fun. So again, one of the biggest things about field day is it's often the biggest operating event for many clubs. And unfortunately, it's often the only operating event for clubs. And I just put together a article for the Ohio Section Journal called uh, Start a Poda Party or at least some other activity. If you like field day, there's a lot of things you can do throughout the year. So it's a shame. Most clubs really gear up for field day, but they ignore the other 11 months of the year. It's a great place for training new hams. It's really, I think, the biggest test of field day with a club is the ability to plan and carry out a group project. So that's why we're doing this in April, because it's actually very late in the cycle. If you want to start planning for your club, you're going to need to move quickly and do some planning. And one of the big things is being flexible is the weather, band conditions, illness, equipment issues, test us each year. So we have to follow a set of rules, even under adverse conditions. And this was really clear three years ago during COVID when things were really disrupted. One of my favorite things about Field Day is some of the past uh, QST uh, covers with the Podunk Amateur Radio Club. And I think a lot of us can, uh, can recognize our own club members in some of these pictures, even though they're a little dated. So Field Day in eight easy steps. Uh, planning is the first step. You need to line up participants, pick a class and a number of stations you want to operate, plan logistics and support, gather equipment, schedule operators, 
set up antennas and antenna supports. And again, this is a link, and I'll go to this link a little bit later, but I have a link here with a lot of information on antennas. Don't forget shelters, emergency power, and, and support. You need to set up your stations with radio, power supply, coax, logging, computer, table, chairs, lighting, accessories, etc. Sometimes one of the most important accessories at field day is a comfortable chair, so you stay in the chair and continue to operate. <laughs> Contesters call that BIC. Yes. But in chair. And it's really important. And I've, I'm shocked many times at field day to see the horrible conditions people put themselves in. You know, even grabbing a lawn chair on your way out of the garage would be a better way to go than that folding metal chair that uh, just breaks your back. And then the fifth step is to operate. And I've seen clubs that get all set up for field day and then no one gets on the air. So I don't understand that. It really amazes me uh, to see a station set, see a club set up eight stations and you go there at 11 o'clock at night or one in the morning and there's one station being operated and you're wondering what is going on here. So try and keep all the stations on the air for 24 hours. I'd rather you set up a few less stations and keep them on the air than set up more stations and not be on there with them. Number six, along with making contacts, make sure you earn the bonus points, eat, and keep hydrated. Step number seven is tearing down and stowing all the equipment. And if you do this step very well, it makes step number two a much easier next year when it's time to set everything up. And step number eight, submit a log entry. If you operated separate from your local club, you can use your club's name on the form. So this is the form. And again, this link will take you out to it. Uh, you come in here and you choose where it says go to data entry and you fill out all this information. You get bonus points for doing this actually by submitting it online like this. And I don't even know if you can do it on paper. I wouldn't even imagine doing it on paper if you could. So do it on the website and put all the information in here. The one thing I do want to mention, if you're an individual or if you're an individual that's part of a club, but not operating with the club, you can get your aggregated score to the club by picking your exact name of your club from this list when you submit your log. So even though I won't be operating with my local club, I'll be submitting a, a my club in the listing here. And it's a rather long list, and it happens to be mine right there. So that's it. That's eight steps to field day. That's all we need to talk about, Marty. I think we're done. <laughs> all right. Well, I think we better put a little more meat on the bone. Let's. Okay. Uh... Let's, I'm going to let you go ahead for a while. Okay. Very good. Um Operating classes, um, the, the purpose of segregating into different categories or classes is so that uh, when you're comparing your results with others, which a lot of people do, they want to see how they come out against others who are using basically similar uh, levels of equipment and operators and so on. You know, uh, you know, two, three, you know, three three people in one radio is different from having uh, 12 people in four radios. Um, the, uh, the classes themselves are based in, in they're defined in the rules and based on uh, primarily on first, uh, how many transmitters you're operating simultaneously. Second, whether you're a one or two person operation or more than two. And then third, um, whether you are taking the, uh, uh, the middle road in terms of power, you know, using generators and so on, independent of commercial mains, or whether you go more extreme and you're operating from battery and alternative sources only on very low power, that's five watts or less. Uh, so a class A is the most popular and the most, well, I don't know, maybe in COVID, I think class D almost took over. <laughs> but I'll tell you, if, if you can operate with a group, you will get more of the benefits of field day than you will just operating by yourself in your backyard. I've done both. And uh, the, the latter was not that much fun. I, I, I toughed it out, but it wasn't much fun. But getting with others and, and uh, making it happen is really where it's at. So if you have th three or more folks, uh, that could be a club or non-club. You don't have to be an organized group. You don't have to be an ARL affi affiliated club. Um, and you basically, you don't use any facilities that are either already a radio station or permanently installed. You can't, you know, put a tower up in the mountains and then uh, come back and put your antennas up on it every, every field day. 
you're basically starting from scratch. You can use trees, existing buildings, anything else that you may have uh, as part of your installation. Uh, uh, if there's a shelter of some sort already there, well, like a bandstand or a, a fire lookout, you can use that. Uh, but uh, it has to be not part of a permanent radio station. And then all the equipment has to be within a thousand foot circle. That's usually not too hard, except, you know, if you've got a lot of transmitters and a get on the air station, uh, at some point you're going to start be, you're going to start crowding one another, both in terms of uh, uh, physical space and in terms of RF. And we'll talk a little bit on, in, on uh, the safety side when we get there about uh, where you put things uh, within that thousand foot circle. Um, we mentioned that the power output is limited to 500 watts. But uh, you really, uh, you probably want to keep to the 100 watt level because it basically doubles the number of points you get. Uh, you know, a, a phone contact is worth two points if you're making it at 100 watts or less, but it's only worth one point uh, if you're if you're if you exceed if you exceed the uh, 100 watts. And like all uh, the AWR contests now, they've removed the 150 watt for the low power and replaced it with 100 watts. So that's and that's consistent with other um, other contest sponsors. And frankly, most most uh, unamplified radios these days, you know, there are a few big the, the ones that hold your desk down and it takes <laughs> two people to carry. Yeah, they'll operate 150 or 200 watts, but 100 is about the limit for most of them. And and you really you don't need more than that. I mean, you can have a lot of fun with five watts. I can tell you, I've done it. We've set the world record twice for field day using five watts or less, but that's with all very, very experienced operators because the very low power level makes it really challenging. If you've got a bunch of new operators, you don't want to burden them with having to try and work with five watts. Um, the, 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 the true contesters can do that and, and uh, get a lot of benefit for it because they get five points for contact instead of two, but it makes it not so much fun for the newer folks who just want to get on and make some contact. So that uh, that hundred watt level is probably ideal. Now, let me if just you're only going to have one or go, let Anthony. Just, let me just add one quick thing here. The, the the it doesn't matter whether you run one radio at hundred watts and run one radio, radio at five watts. You always have to use whatever the higher amount is. So you can't get bonus points by operating one radio at five watts and your other radio at 100 watts. A good so point. just remember that it's consistent for the whole field day site, not on a radio per radio basis. Yeah, good point. Now, Class B is one or two persons portable, otherwise very much like the, uh, the, the Class A setup. And this is typical if you have, say, a couple of people want to hike up into a, to a mountaintop or uh, just uh, two friends getting together, and you don't have a large group, uh, so they obviously there's there are fewer hands to do the setup and so on. So that's that's one of those cases where uh, this this category may make sense for you. Uh, one of the mistakes most people think is the B stands for battery, and that's not true. Nope, nope. B is just one or two people. That's it. And uh, it, just like the other classes, you you know you have different power levels and so on that you can use. And here's it, a here's a rundown of them. Uh, again, you go back to the rules and you can see where you fit. But uh, using batteries, by the way, is fine. But if, if you're going to use your hundred watt radio with uh, a hundred amp hour uh, lithium iron phosphate deep cycle battery, yeah, it'll it'll run fine. You won't have to screw with a generator, but it doesn't. It doesn't change your point value. It doesn't change your entry class. Uh, if you're running that level of power, whether you're using a generator or a battery bank, and I'll be operating two. I'll be operating uh, one. I'm sorry, two Bravo one is what I'll be. But actually, I just announced it as two Bravo. Two Bravo one is two radios, one operator. Okay, then class C is for the mobile operator. You know, there are a number of contests that don't have any category for somebody who's mobile because you either, for example, at VHF contest, you either have to visit multiple grid locators or uh, you have to be, uh, you have to stay within one little narrow uh, uh, radius of uh, location. So for somebody who's just driving across town, uh, th there's nothing for them to do. But here in field day, if you've got somebody who's, uh, say, uh, doing a long-distance drive, or they've got to be out in the car for a couple of hours, they can get on mobile, and they can operate there, um, and they can uh, they can talk to any other field day station. 
Uh, you don't have to be moving, but if you're in a vehicle that is, if it's configured for the road, in other words, you don't have a, uh, you don't have a coax coming out your window hooked to a tower trailer that's up. Okay, then uh, then you're mobile, and that's Class C. There's a bunch of resources here on Class C operations if you're thinking about doing that. And one of the things that came up during COVID was, well, what if I take five Class C stations, put them all in a circle, and then I, I want to be a 5C? Well, it doesn't work that way. The number applies only to one individual vehicle. So if you want to have a barge with 12 stations on it, you can do that. But you can't bring five vehicles in the one lot and become 5C magically. <laughs> You're better off if you have five vehicles, bring them into the into the lot and be a class A or B station uh, and use fixed antennas. And this is an example of what Marty was talking about. This is not a class C station because they can't operate until they stop and put the tower up. And they can't drive with that thing up either. Yes. <laughs> or at least they shouldn't. <laughs> we do not advise that. And then you've got things. class D, uh, which is the home station. And uh, in, the, uh, in the classic rules, class D stations cannot work other class D stations. In other words, not a home-to-home -home kind of thing. They waive that for, um, uh, for uh, once the, the COVID uh, requirements hit and uh, separation and all that. Because uh, they knew a lot of people would be stuck at home, and they didn't want them uh, with nobody to work, so they they uh, they made that waiver. I expect at some point that waiver is going to go away, but it is continued for 2023. It is continued, and then Class E is the home station, but you're not running off commercial power. Now, when I we we talk about running off commercial power, we're talking about the transmitter, the receiver and any equipment that is necessary to sending or receiving a signal. So if you're operating uh, CW only and you're logging with the computer, the computer could be plugged into a commercial AC, but uh, the radio, uh, the transmitter transceiver is going to be, is going to be powered uh, with uh, emergency power, non-commercial power. Uh, if you're, however, if you're running uh, FT8, for example, where the computer is part of the transmitting chain, then that computer also has to be operated independent of commercial mains. Class F is class a F, class. Yes, class F is for uh, emergency operation centers. Now, this is not uh, uh, this is not something that you know a club makes up or uses. It says, "Well, we have our clubhouse and we use it for emergencies." That doesn't count. Uh, even the uh, if you're uh, operating, say, the uh, uh, XYZ Corporation Club Station, uh, and they have what they call an emergency operations center, that company's club operations center does not qualify as an EOC unless you get advanced permission from ARRL headquarters. Uh, this is really for cities, counties, juris you know, government jurisdictions that have an official EOC or an alternate EOC location. And in that case, by the way, you can use things that are permanently installed. Now, one of the things is all the stations of the organization have to be at the same location. There's no distributed joint type of operation. The only exception to this would be a Class D station can be operated remotely by multiple people at different locations if you want to. But you miss a lot of the fun that way. Yes. Now, you do get to submit your scores as aggregated club scores, but they are listed separately from the rest of the results. And that is not in lieu of sending an individual score. It's in addition. It's an yes. overlay. You know, I have, if when I, back in the in the 2021, when we couldn't go anywhere, 2020, uh, I was operating from my backyard. I entered as an individual in 1E, but then I also uh, per contributed my score to other members of my group that were operating similarly and the overlay doesn't put any limitations on location so even though my club is located in ohio and i'll be operating from west virginia i can still use the overlay to give them aggregate points all right uh, so we have the class the maximum number of simultaneous uh 
uh, transmitted signals that establish uh, the whether you're um, 4A or a 1B or whatever. Um, at that point, you've established what you're going to be sending to all the other field day participants when you make a contact. And it's going to be that, that designation plus your ARRL section uh, or uh, Radio Amateurs of Canada section. And uh, so if you're mobile in Wyoming, you see uh, I'm, uh, you send uh, um, KZT, this is N6VI, one Charlie, Wyoming. And uh, he would send back, Roger, your one Delta, West, Penn, West PA, uh, if he's uh, at home in uh, Pittsburgh. So uh, those, those numbers are what you're going to send and receive. And if you have a lot of operators who are um, new to field day, this is a good time to make some cheat sheets up and help them. I, uh, particularly I, for uh, if the band is going to, if you're going to be on a band that's fairly busy and it, it, the HF bands where you're not just operating locally, where everybody's got pretty much the same section. A lot of new operators are not familiar with ARL sections, particularly if they've never done an ARL sweepstakes or something. So um, uh, it's a good idea to make up a cheat sheet. I usually do it by, uh, by call area. And then uh you have the spelled out state and you have the common two or three letter abbreviation. Uh, and I tell people, if you start hearing phonetics, it means they're spelling it out. If they're selling, sending whiskey, that's going to be whiskey Victor. Okay. Uh, and if they start giving you the actual name of it, uh, then you know that, okay, we, we put down the, the common state abbreviation as you would pretty much like the postal abbreviation. So, so prep them a little bit. Marty gave away a secret. At the end of this, we're going to give you a number of resources for field day. And one of those is a list of the ARRL sections. And I actually have generated two lists. One is in alphabetical order and one is by the number that you would typically see in the call sign. So it has all the first district, including the Canadian stations. It has, it. and then there's also another list here which for some reason is not working. I, have to, I got the wrong link here. I'll fix that. That's link. all right. <laughs> There's an alpha page here also that has them sorted alphabetically. And probably the most common one that new operators messed up is Oregon and Orange because they think that they, they both start the same. So ORG is not Oregon. It's Orange County, California. And OR is not Orange County. It's the state of Oregon. Same some with South Dakota are, and San Diego. Yes, that's another, okay. yes. But, so, uh, and also remind those new operators that uh, not everybody with a one call sign is going to be one of those uh, seven or eight yes. sections, uh, because obviously call signs, unlike the old days, call signs are not are now portable. And uh, if I move from California to uh, Florida and I have uh, I'm on for field day and I'm using my call, it will still be an N6 but we'll be giving out South Florida, whatever it may be. So make sure they know that uh, it's not a hard and fast correlation between the, the number in the call sign, the area in the call sign, and the subset of sections that normally go with that call area. Well, we'll have all those resources for you at the end here. Now, Part of this, even though, again, it's not a contest, we want you to improve your operating. So strategy is important in that. If you want to increase your score, some strategy can very much help. Uh, picking a location can be a very important part of this. And that's one of the first things that most clubs need to think about is where you're going to set up, how you're going to set up, how many transmitters you're going to have, what type of antenna approach are you going to have? Are you going to go for towers with beams on them? Are you going to go with simple push-up mast? Are you going to go with verticals? Those are all things that are part of the decision-making and planning portion of things. And, and those choices are going to affect somewhat uh, how your station performs, but it also is going to affect how long it takes you to set up and tear down. And uh, in my, you know, my estimation, uh, if you've got a lot of operators that are very new to HF, I would say go the extra effort and, if you can put up a tri-bander instead of a, a dipole, uh, I would say do it because it will make their experience more enjoyable. They will have, they will hear more stations, they will reach more stations, and that'll make it fun for them. You know, sitting in front of the radio and not working anybody for an hour at a time is not fun for anybody. 
And being on the coast where you're at, Marty, that beam is even better to have than it is in the middle of the country. So uh, we're, we're, we you don't know, need rotators. We yes, just point, point 70 degrees and that's it. Yes. Um, you can have some, you can add extra stations that don't count towards the number total. If you're a class A or class F station, you can't do it if you're a B, C, or D, but a class A or F can have what's called a go to station and a VHF UHF station without increasing the number. The VHF station uh, can be operated on any band above 50 megahertz, so six meters and up. It doesn't change your number. You can have you, you can be your three stations you start out with, be three alpha, and then add a VH, free VHF UHF station. So again, the word free is a strong suggestion that you probably want to try and do this if you have enough people around to do it. And remember, that's that's one where any licensed class can operate it. You don't need a you don't need a general or higher. You don't need a control op, a control operator other than the tech who's uh, sitting in front of the uh, microphone. And it doesn't mean that's the only VHF station you have. If you're in an area that has a lot of VHF activity in urban areas and so on, you could have one of your transmitters be a VHF station and a second one be a free VHF station. So one could be sitting there running folks on a uh, two meter and 220 simplex and the other could be uh, hunting folks down on uh, on uh, 440 FM and so on. And that's uh, that's perfectly fine. It's not intended to limit how many VHF stations you can have. But just remember, one of them doesn't count in your total and any additional stations do. The GOTA station, again, class A or F, with two or more transmitters. So you can't be a 1A and you can't be a 1F. You have to be at least a 2A or 2F or higher. You can have a GOTA station. And GOTA stands for get on the air. Uh, it is limited in who it could operate it. And there's some changes in the rules for 2023. The first change is there's no limit to the number of contacts made by the GOTA station. There used to yeah, be Yeah, it used to be limit. 500? Yes. Yeah. GOTA station contacts are worth five points regardless of the mode. So notice that even if you're making phone contacts on the go to station, they're worth more than phone contacts from your regular stations. In addition, bonus points may be earned by this station under rule 7313, which I'll show here in a few, few moments. The go to station must use a different call sign from the primary field day station. And the go to station must use the same call sign for the duration of the event regardless of operators change. So don't think that you're going to have whoever the operator is choosing the call sign. Pick one call sign from one of your members and use that for the go to station call sign throughout the event. Even though there's only one go to station, you're still going to use the same exchange as the rest of the group does. So if you're a 3A, you're going to say 3A, even though the go to station is only one station. But because it has a separate call sign, the go to station can work any or all contacts that are also already being logged by the main station. So it's like it's like a fresh slate. You every, everybody is eligible. Uh, you can work any anybody in field day. So it's a it's a great opportunity to uh, to uh, warm the bands up and, and get people uh, give people plenty of contacts to make. Now the only people you can't work is you can't work your your other station you can't record work yeah. your regular station so don't plan on doing that but there's a couple of limitations on the go to station any person licensed since the previous year's field day regardless of license class can operate go to so if you have someone that's coming out for the first time uh to operate it doesn't matter what class license they are it could also be a generally inactive licensee so someone who's been uh, off the bands for 20 years or something along those lines. You can also use non-licensed persons under the direct supervision of an appropriate control operator. So you still need to have a control operator there, but you can have, uh, your, I could have my grandson come in and operate. He's not a ham, but he could operate the go to station as long as there's a control operator there. In addition to little kids, a great option for uh, the go to station is if you happen to have a reporter or a uh, served agency representative yep. or a government official come by, you could sit them down and, and coach them through a contact or two. And I'll tell you, that that really gets them excited sometimes. And that's one thing we always keep on our list to do when we have the publicity person come out. We set them down to go to station immediately. Um, you need to keep track of all the operators and participants for the go to station uh, for the turn for the, when you turn in your um, entry. 
Now, just like any time else, the FCC rules require that you have a valid control operator present at the control point if operating beyond the licensing privileges of the participant. So that would be the case with the go-to station. Also, there's one other limitation. Even though field day is predominantly a domestic event, you can't work uh, third-party traffic uh, outside the U.S. unless they have an agreement with the U.S. So as long as your go-to station is working all U.S., Canadian, and uh, for the most part, uh, Western Hemisphere stations, you're okay. The problem comes in if you start all of a sudden working a bunch of Japanese stations or European stations where we don't have a third-party agreement. Now, here's that, that 7.3.13. Any successfully completed contacts made by an operator at the go-to station are worth five points, regardless of the mode. And if the go-to station is supervised by a go-to coach, this is something new this year, a single 100-point bonus will be earned. So if you designate someone as a go-to coach, the coach supervises operation of the station, doing such things as answering questions, talking them through making contacts, but they cannot make the contacts or perform logging functions. So you can't have your go-to coach being the logger for that station. To qualify for this bonus, there must be a designated go-to coach present and supervising for at least 10 contacts, but they don't need to be there for the next 999 contacts. You can do run the go-to station without the go-to coach there. So I would suggest you definitely appoint a go-to coach for this year. Only one transmitted signal is allowed from the go-to station at any time, and it does not affect any of those stations. So that's the basics. We're going to dig in a little bit deeper now, but before we go any further, we're going to put up the caution sign and say safety first, because just recently, yet another amateur left our ranks due to an electrocution of an antenna striking a power system. K5NA. Yes. And the thing is, it happens sometimes at home stations but not as often as it does when you're operating in the field a couple oh. things happen when you're operating in the field you're not familiar with the surroundings so you don't necessarily know about electrical utilities that are there second of all you're putting up and taking down a lot more antennas a lot more quickly so it's very very important that you follow the awrl safety checklist uh and that's available through the link it's part of the field day package not just antennas. This is the one from 2022, but the one in the package will be with the right logo on it. Also, and, don't yeah, climb. You, you know, let me let me just mention that uh, the the list that the ARO provides is is important but not comprehensive. Uh, you you need to just like you do for any other deployment, look around and see what hazards there might be. Uh, and before you have people even start setting up, uh, you need a safety briefing by the safety officer. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, we operate at a fire station that happens to have a, a, a helipad that has been decommissioned. Uh, the edges of that helipad, as you'd expect, have nothing around them. And it's just a drop off of uh, 100 feet to the street below. Uh, clearly, somebody wandering around at night who's, uh, who's not to being careful uh, could have a nasty accident. So uh, we mark that area, we flag it off uh, when it gets close to the edge, and we tell everybody that, especially at night when, when it's a little harder to see the terrain, you make sure to stay away from that. So that would be a, an inherent hazard at this site that we want to keep everybody aware of, in addition to the standard items of you know, uh, flagging your uh, uh, flagging your uh, guy lines and your cables, and trying to minimize fall and trip hazards. Uh, routing your cables so that they're not uh, somebody's not catching their foot on them at night. Uh, keeping uh, you know, keeping your tent stakes uh, padded so that somebody doesn't uh, hit their head on them, and so on. Yeah, and almost every site has its own unique things. We have gopher holes on actually not gopher. We have groundhog holes on our hill. Oh. Actually on Groundhog Hill, what is what its name? So you put your foot in a groundhog hole and you go down really far, really fast. So, uh, hey, can you put your masts in those things? <laughs> <laughs> they're never they're never perfectly perpendicular to the ground. He always oh. has them at an angle. <laughs> okay. Don't rush. Don't cut corners. Don't go near overhead wiring. My rule on overhead wiring is I want to be twice the distance of the antenna from any electrical wiring, and don't forget. 
that not just power po poles have electrical wiring in them. Do not use light poles. Do not use, because they have power in them, and you could easily get shocked if they don't. They're not properly insulated and properly installed. Generators uh, really important. A lot of people use generators, but uh, the uh, the National Science Foundation did a study many years ago uh, about the carbon monoxide output of small generators and uh, uh, horsepower for horsepower, it is many, many times, like on the order of 10 to 20 times more than a vehicle, even a small vehicle, uh, because the EPA has very strict regulations on the emissions from vehicles, but it doesn't have strict regulations uh, of the same sort on the emissions from uh, small generators and small engines. So you want to keep uh, the exhaust away from any enclosed area, whether it's the inside of a car or a van or a trailer or a tent where people sleep uh, or uh, any covered area where people are operating, you get the generator as far away as you can, uh, uh, preferably on a, you know, on a level area that's, uh, that uh, the exhaust is uh, pointed away, it's downwind from you and you have uh, plenty of distance to, to protect yourselves. Um, and when you're refueling, especially if you're out in the field, as out here in the West, uh, you know, the, the area you are may have a lot of brush and uh, some of that brush is pretty dry. So that's not a good place for your generator. You need a cleared out area. If you have to bring your hoe and, and uh, you know, uh, scrape off the ground and make a nice clean circle, you do that. That's also where you keep your fuel. And when you're refueling, Turn that generator, let people know we're going to generator is going to be off for a couple of minutes. You turn it off, you refuel it. Uh, if you want to avoid that, uh, that uh, inconvenience, you can always uh, get a, uh, you, some generators have, you know, special caps you can use and, and a spare tank so that it will draw from that tank and it basically, it refuels itself real time. <laughs> and Scott says we regulate the methane from cows. Okay. Now, one of the things you might be thinking is, well, maybe I'll do class B and I'll just go ahead and set up my radio outside on my nice patio and hook it up to my tower and be ready to operate. Well, that is not a class B station because you're still using home structures and home conveniences. And the ADOM world actually has a whole FAQ on it. I'm not going to go through the whole thing now because, as you can see, it's quite long. And in there, they really talk about whether it's really a class B and really you have to leave behind not only all the antenna facilities, but also home conveniences, AKA toilets and other things. So if you have a big property and you can go off on the other side of the world, that's fine. But otherwise uh, just operating class B may not be the way to go if that's your, what your situation is. Yeah. Oh, by uh, the way, we had an interesting, uh, an interesting twist on that uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, one club, they decided they wanted to give new operators a chance to uh, experience field day on HF. So what they did was they put up a big dipole in the trees. They ran the coax down and one by one, people would drive their cars up and hook up to their radio and uh, make a few make a few content, uh, field day exchanges and make the contacts and log them. And they said, well, they're all they're all uh, uh, one B. And I said, no, they're not, because they're using <laughs> something that's permanently or at least temporary. It's installed for field day use, and they didn't do it. It wasn't their station. So even something you put up for people to use one after the other in field day, each of those would essentially be a probably a, 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 one D, a one E station. And as Marty said earlier, probably the biggest bang for your buck is to operate a class A station with the other group of people. So you learn a lot of things and have a lot of fun. But if you don't have a local club available, or if you're going to be going to a remote location, class B is a very feasible way to operate. You could take your vehicle and use a portable antenna with it that is not attached and be, turn it into a, a class B. It wouldn't require you installing anything other than the antenna. You could get on there very quickly from a parking lot. A go box is a great way to go or a temporary installation of your station a distance from your home. And I'm going to skip over a couple of these. There's information on go boxes. Here's an example of a 1B station that's very quick to set up because they just drive the car into place, put up the mast. It's not a 1B because they can't drive with it like this, but this antenna is going to be it's so not a much 1C. better. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. It won't be a 1C. It'll, it'll be a 1B. 1B, yeah. And this antenna is going to be so much better than the car antenna. So if you want to make a lot of contacts and you can stop the car and put up another antenna, probably 1B is the way to go, not 1C. I'm going to skip over a few of these things on 1C. So here's a couple of suggestions. I've operated class B a lot, and I think Marty's done a few also. Um, so just a couple of suggestions. Always include extra connectors and adapters because when you go off and operate without a big group of people, you're the only person that's bringing things. So you need spare fuses, tools to make repairs. One of the things I really strongly suggest is don't rely on one antenna. Even if you have the best antenna in the world, if something happens to it, you're done. So I always make sure I have two antennas. Even if one is a really bad compromise, it's better than no antenna at all. As and they say, to, two is one, one is none. Yes. And I have a whole presentation on portable operations that really stresses that. I also suggest if you're going to operate class B, make sure you have a second radio with you if you you really want to operate. Because if you go off a distance and don't have a second radio and something happens, you're not going to make any contacts. By having two antennas, though, means that you have a chance to work additional bands. You have a lot of different things. And I have information on selecting a site, um, bringing backup of all my software with me, spare cables. If you're going to operate uh, FT8, you might want a USB GPS receiver to be able to time sync your computer. It's really a portable operation in a lot of cases, and I suggest you take a look at my portable presentation that I did for Rat Pack a little while back. Here's a couple of my Class Bs. I just mentioned the first year I did a Class B was 2007. We went out on the train to Glacier, and I operated from a picnic table outside a little cabin right outside of Glacier. Is that your goat uh, station? Yeah, that's. I, I didn't have a go <laughs> no goat station allowed with 1B. But it was a goat station. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> a couple years later, I went to Acadia, Maine, and I was I asked if I could operate from the top of Cadillac Mountain. They said, as long as you don't sleep there, you can operate. So I operated very close to the path. I found one rock to use as a chair and one rock to use as a table, opened my go box and operated. I was very close to the, the trail, though, so I actually made a lot more eyeball contacts than actual contacts. But I did have the unique experience of being the first field day station in the entire U.S. to have sunlight because of the combination of being up high and being east. Uh, Cass, West Virginia, I'm going to be down that area again. I'm going down to Watauga State Park this year in West Virginia. Uh, this is a, a yurt in the panhandle of West Virginia. Uh, this is a cabin in Hocking Hills, Ohio. Here's my go box. I'm operating my KX3 here. This is the Volkswagen van that for many years was our clubs, one of our club station locations. Even after the engine was blown out, we continued to tow it to the field day site for four more years. <laughs> well, that's year, dedication. Was, yeah, well, it was, it was only a half a mile from my house. But the thing was, one of the, the person was towing me one year was using a 20 foot chain and they slowed down and I end up, I pulled up alongside him and motioned for them to move faster. So. <laughs> Uh, this is um, operating in Maine. I'm sorry, in Vermont. And this is when I started doing, this is the second year I did 2B, 1B. So on my right here is my, C, my CW and phone station. On the left is my FT8 station. And uh, I can do that. I can't do two phone, I can't do SOR2, S -O -R but I can do one uh, CW and one FT8 station at the same time. So if you can't get someone else to go along with you, you can always operate solo. And again, that would be 1B, 1D, 1E, or 1C. Now, the thing about that is you're not going to have a control operator. So you're going to have to only work within your particular license class. So we'll talk a little bit about if you're a tech here in a few moments. So your license class may greatly influence the bands and modes you can operate if you're operating by yourself. If you're not able to put up outside antennas due to HOA, you can think about things like window balconies, et cetera. But it's actually better to just get away from the house and forget about the HOA, find a park to go to or something like that. Uh, FT8 and FT4 and CW are much more effective than single sideband with poor antennas. Now, if you're operating as a technician class, you can operate VHF, 
six meters and two meters. You can make satellite contacts. You can operate 10 meter single sideband when it's open, which it should be this year. Or you can operate CW only on 80, 40, 10, and 15. But you can't work 20 meters. You can't work phone on 40. So there are some limitations for field day. I have a whole presentation on technicians' life beyond local repeaters. You can watch for more information on that. And I'm going to skip through the rest of these real quick. Uh, while you're doing that, Anthony mentioned, or uh, uh, Barry mentioned, uh, no category for a club that has a permanent station, but with no plumbing or anything. But, well, if, if you have any facility that is set up with anything permanent, like whether it's a, a you know a coax routing or a mast or something, uh, that is basically one uh, uh, D or one E. Yes. If you're interested in CW and you want to gear up before the field day, there's a chance to still do that. And I have a whole presentation on CW operations and more. And I'll tell you, CW that. I think is the most for me the most fun on field day because yes. uh, even with with everybody using compromised antennas compared to what they typically have at home. Uh, signals may be a little weaker, but it's way easier to pick them out, especially if the conditions are a little noisy, way easier to pick out CW uh, signals than it is sideband signals. I've, I've, uh, I've done uh, early morning shifts on 20 meters. And when I went from phone to CW, my rate went way up and the number okay. of repeats went, requests went to zero. One thing I've done each year, when I work, whenever I work with a local club, I always put together a simplified list of field day rules that I can pass out to everyone. It's important to read all the rules, and someone needs to coordinate that, usually the field day chairperson or someone else. But I always want a simple sheet that I can hand to people on the week before when we have our our, our final meeting. Here's the rules, and this is how it works in uh, about three pages. And you can put something together like this. I have a link. You're welcome to copy this and change it if you want to. But this that seems long for simplified, but it's a lot shorter than the package. <laughs> yes. And the people will read it if it's short enough. There's also a lot of videos out there. If people are new, tell them to watch a video on operating field day and get an idea of what it's like before they come out. Especially with the logging software. And by the way, whatever software you're going to use, I strongly encourage you to have a cheat sheet that you make up that shows of the basic commands, because if somebody makes a mistake in entering a call, they get all flustered and everything stops and, and until they call for help. Uh, there are most of those things you can fix on your own, even a new operator. You just give them uh, a couple of basic instructions on what to do. Like if you're in the middle of entering something and it's wrong, you can do Alt-W and start with a clean sheet. And I'm going to talk about some opportunities to try all that out, but uh, we're not going to go through this, but there's a bunch of information here on, on uh, emergency power, batteries, solar. We just had a session on uh, solar generators, which are basically glorified batteries that work with a solar charging panel. Um, if you need a, to be able to operate your computer on batteries, one of these little book-shaped uh power banks that operate at 20 volts allow you to feed directly into it without having to convert back to AC through your adapter. I have one like this and I can operate a computer for the full field day week without no problem. Yeah, it. well, let me also mention that even though most power adapters for computers, for laptops are uh, 18 to 19, 18, 20 volts, something like that, that's just so that they can charge the battery. If you open up the battery in your laptop, typically it's going to be around 12 volts. Yeah. And so you can take your standard 12 volt source that you have and uh, make it a make a uh, a cable adapter for it and use it to run your laptop. It won't be the 18 that charges the internal battery, but it'll be enough to run the thing all weekend. Yeah, laptops run fine on 12 volts. Most people don't get that. <laughs> uh, this is the link that I talked about for antennas. This has. This was originally put together for the year when we did have COVID and everyone had to figure out what kind of antennas they were going to do on their own. So it has information, but this is good for your club. It talks about different types of wire antennas, verticals, beams, mag loops, integrated, mobile. And then there's a section on each of these with links to both commercial versions, uh, DIY versions, and information for all different types of antennas. So again, that link is in here. Now, I can't imagine doing field day without a computer to log with. I did it many years ago with the giant dupe sheets that took up a big piece of plywood. And 
it's just so much easier to do it. So I would really strongly suggest, unless you're going to do a half a dozen contacts, to use a computer. Uh, and I, we have information here on interfacing your computer. That's one of the hardest parts. The two most popular pieces of software are N1MM uh, and N3FJP. And here's information on a Rat Pack program I did on using N1MM for field day. And you can watch the video recording of that. Here's N3FJP. It's a commercial software, but it's not that expensive. You just, just want the field day package. I think it's only $8.95. So it's very inexpensive and it's easy to use. And some people like this because it's a little simpler, but whatever one you're going to use, try it out ahead of time. Both of them have demos so you can try them out with the people. There's other software. And if you have if you have other logging software uh, yes. that it'll accommodate, I mean, write log, win test, yes. all those, uh, these are ones that we use in major contests. And if you already have it, uh, feel free to use it. They all, all have uh, ARRL field day. It may or may not... Uh, give you an accurate real-time point count, if, you know, based on the rule changes and so on, but uh, it'll work fine for logging. And remember, you don't have to turn in your log. All you're turning in is a list of contacts by band and mode. And exactly. so all the other stuff that's in there, it's not like you have to put together a Cabrillo file or anything else. And as Marty mentioned earlier, the rule has not changed. So if you really want a lot of points, operate CW and digital, you get twice as many points. Uh, you can also get the power, power multiplier, which we mentioned earlier, but remember that it only applies to the highest amount of power you're using on any given station. Now, there's a ton of bonus points, and we're not going to go through them all, but you need to look through the list to make sure that you're getting all the bonus points that are available. Depending on the class you operate, some of them will be available and some will not be available. Some of the most common ones that people ignore that are worth easy points are things such as submitting via the web, copying the W1AW bulletin, uh, sending out messages, having visitors by agencies. These are all 100-point bonuses. Now, uh, that's 100 single sideband contacts or 50 phone, I'm um, sorry, 100 single sideband contacts or 50 CW or digital contacts for each of these. So this is a gives you an indication of what's available. But make sure you go through the whole bonus and make sure you do that. Don't forget the media publicity and social media site visitation, not only because you get bonus points, but they're also part of the whole idea of field day is advertising amateur radio to the rest of the world. Think about having your field day site also have educational activities. Uh, I have an article with uh, information on ideas on this that I put together for the Ohio section journal a couple of years back. It talks about the whole things you can do, mini fox hunts, uh, making a clothespin Morse code key, all different types of activities you can do with uh, your site for educational activities. I had an impromptu one one year uh, when uh, they were uh, the, when our prep time, they were laying out uh, coaxes for a tribander, and and the SWR was terrible. <laughs> Something was wrong, so I I pulled the coax and I started looking at it. And I got to one end of it and I saw the PL259 on there with the shield showing in the back. And I knew that that was a problem. It had not been installed correctly. So I pulled out my tools and I gathered everybody around and we did an impromptu how to properly attach a PL259 to a piece of RG213. And uh, believe it or not, the person who brought all those improperly done coaxes took them home the next, and by the time that they'd done the next year, every one of them had been redone properly. So the message held. <laughs> about five or 10 years ago, I started forgetting about having paper handouts because they always got wet. They always fell on the ground. They never went home with people. So what I did is I created handouts that were laminated that we could put on the tables at the visitor center with QR code. So they can simply shoot the QR code with their phone to bring the information home. I have one here on what is amateur radio. This is one that I put together that's designed for youth and teachers. You're welcome to use this. Uh, it has the link, but it also has the QR code, uh, links to the Zach and Max comic books, kids radio site uh, information. And then on the back of it, it has another page we would laminate and set out talking about what is field day. A link to our local club so people can do that here's the link that takes them to the club and what we did last year is we set up a radio receiver so they could listen to local stations but we also had we also had instructions so if they wanted to use 
uh, online software defined radios, uh, they could do that. We had instructions on how to use their phone to be able to receive our stations using online software defined radios. Okay, we talked about submitting already. Okay, so here's one of the things I really strongly suggest. Think about having your club take part in some of these upcoming events. They're a great way to test out your software, get used to operating in the modes you're going to be doing during field day. The AWRL Digital Contest is a great place if people want to learn about FT8 and FT4 coming up June 3rd and 4th. The AWRL VHF UHF Contest June 10th and 11th. The phone fray is a weekly contest on Thursdays, which is a single sideband activity. So if people aren't used to making contacts on single sideband, also there's the CW Ops test on Wednesday and the MST, which is a medium speed test on M Monday and Tuesday night, Monday night, Tuesday morning. Uh, these are both great one hour sessions where you can try out your software, teach people how to make contacts in a contest type of setting. There's also two state QSO parties in June. If you wait until June, can, uh, Kentucky or West Virginia, the only two. But this weekend, uh, next weekend is going to be the 7th Area Call District uh, QSO party, the uh, New England QSO party. So there's a ton of parties available before that time. Consider yes, having a local net as a warm up where you make contacts and have people pretend like they're doing field day. Do a POTUS uh, operation is another great way. Make sure you don't you take advantage of the AWRL field day locator. This isn't really filled up that much yet, but it will fill up as we get closer in time. And what you can do is you can go out and look for sites in your area. So make sure you have your site posted uh, on here so people can find you if they want to visit your site. You can add it to there. This is where I'm going to be right here. This is me, I think. This is me yep. at Watoga State Park in Pennsylvania, in West Virginia. So you can go there and put your local club's uh, link at the location on the field day. Location. And if your division and section ARL personnel, <clears throat> their leaders are uh, looking for field day sites to visit, that's one place they'll know how to find you. Yes. Um, some things to maximize your experience. Learn something new. Take some videos that you can show at future club meetings, the new people, or when you're doing that tech class or something like that. Do photos. Have an intra-club competition. Uh, we always do the CW group versus the phone group to see who can get the most points. Now, the, C the phone people have to make twice as many contacts as the CW people, but they have twice as many people to do it and twice as many stations. But we still always beat them on CW. If you are connected to the internet, consider using real-time online scoreboards so your scores are posted and people can see how you're doing. It's not really that easy to do during field day, but it's something you might want to consider for contesting in general. Write up an article for your club's newsletter. Create materials for local media coverage. Live, live stream your operation. We had a blogger come out who does a blog called the 30, 30, the 330, which is our area code. He came out and live streamed his visit to our site. And he had like 1500 hits the first day on his live stream of us. And we had a lot of people get back to us and say, we saw you on the live stream. So um, find someone in your area that does that sort of thing and invite them out. Yeah. This uh, is very important. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, go ahead, Marty. Uh, okay. I want to uh, jump back onto the safety thing again a minute, because uh, we're getting kind of short on time. Um, I mentioned earlier, it's important where you put things within that thousand foot circle. Um, is especially, you know, if you've got, uh, other than wire antennas up, uh, you're going to have some sort of structure, whether it's a, a mast or a tower trailer or ladders or something, uh, that have the ability to fall down if given uh, sufficient encouragement by wind or people tripping over guy wires or something, make sure that within the fall zone of that antenna, there are no stations, there are no tents for sleeping, not the, uh, the, the, the camp kitchen is not there. Keep everything well clear from the fall zone so that you don't have anybody, uh, you know, have the potential to get, uh, to get crushed. So uh, that, that's important in the, uh, in the safety side of things. Just want to make sure we got that in. We didn't mention it, but, um, you get bonus points for having a safety officer. Uh, 
at an A site. So think about doing that. And that's a really good, important thing to do. Have someone that goes around that has authority to shut anything down, close anything off, have people redo things. So there's no question about safety. Having an after action report and plans for improving the next year are a great thing to add to your field day operation. Yeah, we, we do we do full uh, uh, full ICS uh, documentation from planning uh, through after action uh, for our ACS field day, and uh, it's a good chance to get written down all the things that uh, uh, you know significant incidents and and to show your served agencies that you know you practice what you preach. The next three slides talk about how to continue field day interest the rest of the year. If the competitive aspect of field day is one that one of your club's main driving forces, consider getting involved in other contests throughout the year. If the emergency preparedness aspect of field day is one of your club's main driving forces, consider getting involved in a wide variety of MCOM events available throughout the year. Take part in your section's MCOM activities, be part of your local areas, take an MCOM training course. If the community outreach and education aspect of field day is important, consider getting involved in a wide variety of activities, including teaching classes, giving exams, VE sessions, being involved with youth and amateur radio. Showing up at preparedness fairs with uh, yes. good information and, and demonstration stations. <laughs> and get your club, you know, try and take that energy from field day into the rest of the year. And this is the slide with the resources. And I will fix this so that it's the right link. Uh, but there's also the, the link here to the antennas, as I showed you earlier, the What is Amateur Radio, the handout for youth and teachers, the clothespin key, the uh, software-defined radios. Uh, I also have a letter example here of a letter that we give to all of our club members. This is goes out via email, but it's basically uh, the information that goes out to everyone about field day. And then finally, or near the end here, I think we are, uh, this link will take you to two sets of presentations that were done on Rat Pack. Marty and I did one on the Beginner's Guide to VHF and UHF. That's four one-hour long uh, sl slideshow recordings. Uh, and Dennis and I did one on HF. There's three now. We're going to add a fourth one a little bit later. So these are great ways to get planning for uh, VHF and UHF operation and for HF operation. Again, the link for today's presentation is tiny.cc slash FD2023. And I'll put that in the chat. And again, you're going to need to go back and do some homework and read a little bit for this presentation. So now we'll go ahead and take questions and answers, questions and comments, I should say. One of the questions has popped up a couple of times is, uh, where is the satellite package that normally accompanies the uh, field day instructions? Apparently, it was not included. I was not aware of that. Yeah, I was not either. I hadn't, I hadn't looked at everything thoroughly yet. Remember, there are some, some suggestions for satellite operation. You only need to make one contact, so it's really advised that you don't sit there and try and hog the satellite. Uh, making six satellite contacts is not better than making four or three or two. Uh, you're you know, don't be a satellite hog in your area. I think Gene has his hand up for the question. Ah, uh, yes, this is Gene here. Yeah, um, I don't know if it was covered, but how does APRS fit into field day? APRS is what would be considered a demonstration mode. It's not used for making contacts, and so. Uh, if you have a demonstration station for something like that, that could count, you know, for a bonus point. If you have it, you know, explained and something that a visitor could follow, but it's not, it's not a field day contact making mechanism. Okay, so you said uh, you can get points for doing it. Is that correct? Well, if if you use it, uh, remember you you get points for having a, like a demonstration mode. Yes, an educational. Uh, so, or educational yeah. okay so that that's probably where it would fall under okay i understand now thank you other questions please feel free to raise your hand we'll be happy to acknowledge you or put your information in the chat 
And Don is saying that I need a, a updated picture with me riding the goat. That goat scared me so much. I got behind a rock. I was, I was, that goat was edging me towards the edge of a cliff on the going to the sun road and, in, in uh glacier. And that goat just kept coming closer. And I knew that all that goat had to do was bump me and knock me down this 20 foot cliff. And I didn't want to go down the cliff. So I got hey, he wanted to get some operating time. He wanted yes. you to stop hogging the radio. <laughs> Other questions, comments. All As complaints we, go to Dan. Yes, go ahead. This is uh, Frank W8EZT. Um, I have not looked at the information packet yet. That's on my list tonight yet. Our uh, scores, points for contacts for CW versus digital versus sideband, have they changed or is that? No, uh, they were planning on changing it, but it, as Marty mentioned a little earlier, no, they did not change. So they will be the same this year. So two for did two two for digital two for CW one for sideband or one for phone I should say by, and by, by the, the way, way Frank sideband not... phone FM phone all the same thing so you you can't work somebody on two meter sideband and then work them again on two meter FM it's all phone so that's one contact yeah got it and uh, by the way Frank is uh, my lo local club's radio officer and has been the safety officer for a number of years for our field day and Frank good, Frank does good a job Frank job as as safety officer. Please, I ask you don't just jump in. Just uh, use a raise your hand or put a question in the in the box there. If you would, there, uh, Carolyn, you got your hand up. Uh, yes, is the field the field day slide deck is that downloadable, or we just have to access it from the uh, web? If you access if you access it through the web, you'll always get the newest version. But if you go to the slideshow, you'll see on like the third slide. There's a link that says download a PDF and that'll give you a PDF version of it, but that'll freeze it in time. I'd wait until I make the the changes with the new uh, links for the uh, AWRL sections. Okay, got you. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions, comments? Okay, G, you got your hand up. Yeah, this is a loud question. It's a mode that I'm not uh, equipped to uh, utilize, but how does EME work? Uh, well, it's a VHF contact. You're not using, I think you can use it because it's not a satellite as, I mean, it's not an active satellite like a, with a transponder. Um, so it's it's kind of... Uh, uh, it's it's pretty inefficient, I think. If you if you have that kind of station that can get the signals off the moon, uh, you could probably make a lot more contacts using tropo and meteor scatter and so on. Uh, also, the stations you work uh, will um, you know they may they may be uh, DX and they may not be aware of the uh, the field day rules, but I I'm not aware of any prohibition. Yeah, but I would save it for the for the EME activity days and, you know, spend the time with that because it really, you're not, there are not going to be a lot of people trying to make EME field day contacts. I don't think. Yeah, that's pretty much what I thought, but I had to ask. I think we have a number of questions in chat. Can we get Barry to uh, run through those for us? Mr. Barry. Uh, I was watching them here. We're, we're pretty close. We're, we've got most of them covered here. Most of them are just comments. Uh, let's see. Have not seen a link on Voda um, with Field Day. The, definitely, uh, Voda is the volunteers on the air, and uh, there'll be a lot of Voda people on the air during Field Day, so it's a good opportunity. The problem is, I don't know that uh, necessarily you're going to get a contact because they'll be using a club call, so you won't get Voda credit necessarily even if you do work at an officer. Now, if you work me at my two Bravo, you'll get VOTA credit. But in most cases, most of these people will be working with a club station, so there wouldn't be VOTA credit for that. Well, and even, even if they work you from their club station, it's the club that will get the credit. Yeah. It's, it's so the call what? signs on each end that count. Now, the thing that is a good idea that you might want to double up on is you might want to operate from a park and make give POTA credit. And again, you don't have to give out your, your exchange every time for POTA if you don't want to. So the, you could do POTA also at the same time, but VOTA is not really going to work very well for field day. VOTA is an all-year contest yes. as well. And if I remember right, the W1AW portable stations are not on during the field day weekend. That would be correct. 
Any other questions, anyone? Been a great presentation. All right. Well, this has been fun to uh, fun to see everybody, and uh, we thank you for uh, sticking with us. We'll have uh, uh, we'll maybe have some uh, field day after action. Maybe we should have a, a session uh, in July, Dan, uh, with uh, field day after action uh, highlights. We'll put that in the idea column there for for. And talk. there will be a quiz to make sure you read all 154 slides. <laughs> oh, come on. Actually, let me see. Let me see exactly how many are here. I forget exactly how many slides are here. So let's check. There's 155 slides. Uh, so uh, five times the number of participants on this call. Yes. So everyone <laughs> make sure you read at least five slides. All right. Well, are there any more questions? Open for discussion. Anybody got anything to jump in there and say? Oh, by the way, if you are traveling to Dayton this year, uh, I will be speaking at Contest University on the Thursday before. I'm doing two presentations there, and I'll be doing a presentation on Friday at the Hamvention in the antenna forums called the 10 Worst Antennas, and you can do better. So uh, please stop in, and uh, I'll also have a sign out in the, field, in, the, um, in the flea market with the Rat Pack banner on it. So look for the Rat Pack banner and stop and say hi. And uh, I will hope to see some of you at Dayton this year. Okay. I think a lot of us can, talk, can think about the antennas that are worse. <laughs> We've all experienced <laughs> at least one. <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't want your, your home station in his, in his presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that, thanks, everybody. Yes, thank you, guys. Say 73s, and we'll see you tomorrow. All right. Good night, all. To Bravo, West Virginia. Yeah. <laughs>